to our special seminar today. We are so fortunate to have Maury of Steel uh, speaking to us. Uh, this is uh, Maury, a research think tank. We are a policy oriented research think tank, and we believe that we would like to offer research based policy advice to the government. And we have just set up this think tank, as you know, and this think tank uh, has been working quite effectively and efficiently, proud to say that, uh, and contributing into policy making at the national level, as well as in some states. So we feel very fortunate that over this few years that we have been in existence, we have contributed significantly to policy making. It is in this context that we have special seminar series and today's series is exactly following the same pattern and trend. We have been talking and working on contemporary issues. We have been fortunate to have very good professors, actually the best minds we invite from across the world. We are very fortunate that we have been obliged by them. Paul Milgram spoke to us about two months back. Michael Kramer also spoke to us. Just two weeks back, we had Steve Kachati speak to us on cryptocurrency, something which has been discussed extensively in India. And just four days back when the budget was presented, we found mention of it in, in the, in the F, FM's budget speech. So we have been discussing contemporary issues on this special webinar series. Today's webinar, is chaired by Dr. Arvind Birmani, chairman of eGrow Foundation. Dr. Arvind Birmani has been contributing significantly into policy making for nearly three decades. He was the chief economic advisor of our country. He was also the executive director representing India and its other countries uh, at the International Monetary Fund. He has published extensively in refereed journals also, and he has quite a few books to his credit. He's also an expert along with being the top-notch economist in our country, also an expert on geopolitical issues. With this, I invite Dr. Virmani to chair the session and take the proceedings further. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sharan Singh. Um, well, let me very briefly uh, introduce uh, Professor Oxford. Uh, Maurice Oxwell is Professor of Economics at U UC Berkeley since 1989. In 2014-15, he was also a member of President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors. And from 2015 to 2018, he served as Chief Economist at the IMF. I guess we missed each other because I joined the SED in 2019. He has also served as Honorary Advisor to the Bank of Japan's Institute of Monetary and Economic Studies. Professor Oxfeld is a fellow of the Econometric Society, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, research fellow at CEPR, research associate at the NBER, and a non-resident senior fellow at EIIE. He has numerous, two numerous publications and to, to list, but I uh, counted more than 20 papers on various economic issues in the last uh, 20 years or, so, or 10 years or so. With that, uh, Professor Oxford, uh, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bermani it's, uh, uh, and Dr. Singh. It's a great pleasure to be here at um, the eGrow Foundation. Um, I was saying before that it would be an even greater pleasure to be here in person, but uh, you know, in these days of COVID, we do what we do, uh, uh, what's possible. Uh, and my topic today will be the international financial system after COVID-19. Um, it occurs to me that this, this may be uh, uh, a bad choice of title because um, after COVID-19 may, may uh, never arrive if it becomes pandemic, but uh, you should think of this as uh, after the, uh, the acute crisis phase of, of COVID-19. Um, let me outline what I'd like to cover. 
uh, in the time we have. Um, uh, of course, the crisis began uh, early in 2020 uh, with a uh, sharp and historic global financial convulsion, uh, which involved uh, plunging asset prices, um, uh, gyrations and capital flows to emerging markets, uh, strains even in the uh, treasury market in the US. Uh, uh, in fact, capital account volumes were, were uh, at unprecedented levels, both positive and, and negative. And uh, luckily, um, strong policy actions by the advanced economies and uh, counter cyclical responses by emerging and developing economies pulled the world back from the brink of a complete economic disaster. Although the uh, the lockdowns imposed by the uh, the uh, uh, governments of the world to respond to the uh, to the pandemic uh, did involve big losses in output. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I want to talk to some degree about what economists have come to call the global financial cycle um, in the last few years. And I would say that, that even now it remains in an expansive phase, but um, when major central banks tighten further, it will uh, uh, surely turn around. And I maintain that emerging and developing economies will be especially uh, vulnerable to an uneven global rebound, one in which inflation pressures um, in richer countries, especially the US, lead to a sharp tightening while uh, economic conditions remain more subdued in the uh, low and middle income countries. Um, on reflecting over the last couple of years, uh, I will argue that uh, it would be dangerous for the world economy to, to remain reliant on exceptional policy actions uh, of the type that have uh, come to the rescue in uh, 2008, 2009, and again, uh, this time. Uh, instead, we need to think more about the resilience of financial markets. So with that, let me turn to some data. Um, to uh, just uh, think about where financial markets are uh, today. Um, in this chart, I show uh, the uh, uh, ratios of external assets and liabilities. Uh, uh, here I, uh, I uh, um, average them uh, to uh, nominal GDP. Um, and uh, how, how, how it has evolved since 1970. These are data that have been put together by uh, John Maria Malesi Ferretti, who is a deputy research director at the fund, and Philip Lane, who's now the chief economist at the ECB. And uh, they, they encapsulate eloquently um, the explosive growth of international financial markets, um, especially in the 1990s and in the 2000s up until the global financial crisis. And what we see here is that uh, these asset stocks, which we can take as a 
sort of indicator of global financial activity um, after growing sharply up until the financial crisis uh, in 2008 have grown more slowly since then. They have been um, rather flat for the emerging and developing world, um, uh, although um, uh, on average at a high level relative to what was true uh, 50 years ago. And for richer countries, they've continued to grow, albeit at a, at a much slower rate. Um, uh, these data only go through 2019, so they basically end at the time of the uh, emergence of, uh, of, uh, of COVID. So these provide a kind of overview of uh, where financial markets are uh, uh, on the eve of the uh, pandemic. Um, some more recent data uh, from the United States is, uh, is um, useful and indicative, though, and uh, pertains directly to the, uh, the crisis period. Um, we're, we're used to an in international economics uh, measuring uh, several balance of payments concepts uh, and thinking about um, their economic implications, uh, uh, looking for imbalances and thinking about the, the um, consequences for policy. And um, there, there is a data set that the U.S. Treasury uh, uh, maintains for the United States that provide a fairly unique um, lens on the, uh, the capital account of the United States, and in particular, allow us to see how it, how it behaved around the time of the initial COVID crisis. But um, to, to understand this chart, we have to, um, and, it, and its implications, we have to look at a couple of concepts. So essentially, there, there are four series uh, graphed on this uh, on this chart. Um, series A are the gross U.S. resident sales of U.S. assets to foreigners, and Series B is the gross U.S. resident purchases of U.S. assets from foreigners. And if we subtract B from A, we get what we typically call the capital inflow to the United States. And uh, often you'll, you'll, you'll see this referred to as a gross capital inflow, but it's, it's actually not a gross capital inflow because it is a, the net of uh, U.S. resident sales and purchases of foreign assets. And the A and B are graphed together uh, in these, uh, this upper line. Uh, 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 of uh, orange and blue, and of course these these move very closely together uh, due to to the uh, the double entry nature of uh, of balance of payments uh, accounts. Um, C and D pertain to U.S. resident purchases and sales of foreign assets. And the difference between C and D, that is the, the uh, U.S. residents' uh, purchases and their sales of foreign assets is what we would conventionally call the capital outflow. Um, <clears throat> now, to get to the account deficit, we typically uh, subtract the capital inflow uh, uh, or, or subtract from the capital inflow the capital outflow. And this gives us our net borrowing from the rest of the world, which is why we might refer to A minus B and C minus D as gross flows, uh, but they are in fact not, not the true gross flows. Um, let, me, let me make a couple of points about this chart, which I think are interesting. One is that um, uh, U.S. resident transactions in U.S. assets are much higher than 
uh, U.S. resident transactions and foreign assets. And this reflects the, uh, the centrality of the U.S. capital market and of dollar assets in the world economy. And that's a theme to which I will return. Secondly, uh, look at the, uh, the sheer magnitude of these, of these numbers. Now, um, at, the, at the height of the crisis, where you see these big spikes, um, just looking at the transactions in the U.S. Uh, um, asset markets, um, the, the, the numbers reach roughly $7 trillion. Now, these are monthly data, so these must be compared with the monthly level of GDP, and annual U.S. GDP is about $21 trillion. So uh, divide that by 12 and compare that with 7 trillion, and you get a sense for how um, uh, huge the, the, the monthly volume of trading in these, in these markets is. And um, this comes back to the point I raised about resilience. Um, markets need to be able to handle uh, these sorts of volumes or transactions in a crisis in today's world. And uh, uh, we clearly saw in the fall of, uh, sorry, in the spring of 2020 that they were, they were being strained. Uh, the Federal Reserve had to uh, uh, come in with uh, uh, ad hoc and special facilities to, to handle all of this. Um, Okay, so uh, if we were to um, uh, uh, subtract uh, A from B, uh, B from A, we could see the, the, the net U.S. capital inflow, and that's a concept I'm going to show for uh, a group of emerging markets. And you might think it's um, uh, close to zero looking at this chart, but actually um, the scale of the y-axis here is so large that um, it, it does amount to uh, hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, so uh, it's not small at all. Um, here are the uh, uh, capital inflows. So this would be A minus B in terms of the previous chart for a group of, uh, of uh, um, 26 emerging market economies. And um, here we can see that, uh, that uh, going back to 2014, they are volatile. Uh, they become more volatile after the crisis. And we can see the very sharp march plunge of, uh, of uh, uh, capital inflows to these economies, followed by a recovery and um, outsized inflows later on, followed again by a plunge um, as central banks uh, in the advanced economies um, cut rates. And as we um, uh, see the disease uh, progress, now, um, one notable feature of the response to um, the COVID crisis is that in uh, marked economies, uh, central banks mounted really unprecedented counter-cyclical uh, uh, policy programs. Um, these consisted of uh, interest rate cuts, uh, quantitative easing purchases, mostly of sovereign debt, but uh, sometimes even in close coordination with fiscal authorities. Uh, they're not, not as extensively as in developed markets, but countries like Indonesia even um, uh, uh, allowed um, a direct purchase of government debt 
by the central bank, basically monetary financing of the deficit. Uh, foreign exchange intervention was employed. Uh, reserve requirements, including those discouraging capital inflows in some cases were loosened. Um, uh, uh, central banks carried out liquidity enhancing operations, encouraging uh, and also encouraged bank loans to businesses. Uh, there was macro prudential easing, uh, for example, relaxed capital requirements for banks, enhancements to market function, and uh, fiscal responses as well, uh, facilitated by low interest rates, which created fiscal space. Um, uh, the US uh, Fed, as I mentioned, um, uh, had to step in to uh, protect market functioning. And it, it had to do so on a global basis because in some sense, the dollar is a world currency. So the Fed um, extended swap lines for selected countries. And amazingly, uh, during one period in March of 2020, which has been labeled the dash for cash, um, it became hard uh, for uh, uh, foreign central banks that, that held treasuries as reserves even to um, sell them at, uh, at um, liquid prices. And the Fed set up a, a, a special repo facility for foreign central banks to be able to do that. So um, these sets of actions certainly um, provided some cushion to um, emerging economies in the face of this unprecedented crisis. And um, this counter cyclical response was, uh, was very welcome. Um, uh, it, it, it built on the um, responses that many emerging central banks were able to take in even in, in uh, the 2008-2009 crisis, but uh, I would argue went further. And uh, many central banks cut interest rates even as their currencies depreciated, showing the value of a flexible exchange rate. Um, there are a number of, of interesting papers chronicling what central banks did. Um, I would refer you particularly to the, the book by uh, Bill English and co-authors that was brought out by the CEPR and the chapter by uh, uh, Cispedes and De Gregorio on the uh, emerging market response. And one could ask whether emerging markets are now in a brave new world where effectively um, we should think of them as um, equivalent to uh, advanced economies in ter terms of their ability to navigate um, global financial markets and capital flows. And I would argue that, that this is a bit premature. Um, emerging markets started in a relatively strong cyclical position, and they indeed built on a, a recent track record of inflation credibility, as well as uh, uh, impressive growth in policymaker skill. Um, you know, one of the one of the the things I learned at the IMF uh, was the uh, change over time in the uh, the nature of interactions between IMF teams and um, country authorities during the Article Four process and other uh, other interactions. If you go back twenty five years ago. Uh, there was a preponderance of uh, human capital in economics and finance on the fund side. And if you come to today, uh, so many policymakers in emerging markets um, have been um, uh, trained in top PhD programs around the world that um, they're really peers in, in, in many cases with the, the IMF staff.
And uh, in fact, uh, many policymakers and emerging central banks uh, have been on fund staff, have been at the BIS, uh, have been at advanced country central banks and moved move back and forth. So um, uh, this has been a very important uh, factor, I think, in, the, in, in uh, the quality of the policy response. And of course, the, the policy response of the Fed and advanced country central banks driving global interest rates to very low levels, uh, low levels that were expected to persist, um, was, uh, was quite important. And I guess we'll, we'll discuss in the Q&A uh, uh, what, what, uh, how much persistence to expect. But in addition, looking at the, at the medium term future, we should recognize that emerging market finances were stretched by the uh, crisis and there has been scarring which could worsen over time. Um, so governments had to provide fiscal support uh, to their economies. Um, they lost tax revenue. Um, uh, health expenditures were exceptional. Uh, revenues fell even as a share of GDP, and uh, there there have been and will be more supply chain driven inflation pressures. And in terms of the longer run growth picture, um, one thing to worry about in many emerging market countries, but also uh, in some advanced countries, I think this will be a problem for the U.S is that the disruption of um, education uh, due to lockdowns and um, uh, school closure, teacher absence, remote education in some cases, um, this is, this is going to be a, a, a uh, impediment to growth going forward. So we shouldn't be too um, complacent at all. In addition, there are financial stability risks that we uh, should worry about. Um, much government debt resides uh, in emerging market banking systems, which uh, 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 effectively carried out QE. And here I don't mean the, the central bank, I mean the private, the private banks. And this has been pointed out by a number of uh, folks, including the IMF, uh, in their Global Financial Stability Report in April of 2021. Uh, in fact, my uh, uh, my uh, uh, think tank uh, of affiliation, the Peterson Institute, is going to be having a uh, a uh, small webinar on uh, on this topic. Um, hosting Tobias Adrian, who is the financial counselor at the IMF. So, uh, you know, I urge you to uh, sign up for this if you're interested in this topic. Um, credit easing during the crisis may um, confront authorities with harsher trade-offs later when interest rates rise, right? It's, it's great to open up the spigot of credit to all and sundry, but um, not all and sundry will be equally able to um, meet their financial commitments later when interest rates go up. And so there will be a, uh, an issue of uh, possible uh, zombie um, borrowing then. And the same is true of macroprudential easing measures, uh, which, um, uh, were, uh, were taken in many cases. And uh, uh, there's an interesting paper on this recently by Bergant and Forbes. Um, I worry that um, the global community has, has really failed uh, in terms of effectively um, getting vaccines to um, many emerging market countries and um, um, particularly low income countries in Africa. 
And uh, uh, aside from the, the sort of moral and human dimensions of this tragedy, uh, we can all have a self-interest in this because um, large unvaccinated populations, and this is particularly true given the, um, the, uh, some of the health issues in some African countries more generally, can be breeding grounds for new, for new variants. And we've seen this with Delta, we've seen this with Omicron, uh, who knows where the next variant will come from. Um, the, I think there's a general issue to be discussed about the global architecture of um, public health and how the global community can uh, enhance that and prevent the sort of vaccine nationalism that uh, we've seen uh, throughout the world. And, um, you know, my view is that, uh, uh, you know, if, if you look at, uh, at India, it has some wonderful facilities for producing vaccines, uh, you know, notably the Serum Institute, but there are others. And we need, we need more of that in, in more countries. Uh, for when the next pandemic hits, because it certainly will will hit. Uh, let me say something about the the debt situation in the uh, uh, global perspective. Um, so in this chart, the red dashed line uh, shows the uh, behavior of debt to GDP in the uh, advanced economies, and that's measured on the right-hand vertical axis. And you can see how this rose during the pandemic very sharply, but it, it rose from, from a high level. And um, uh, it rose after a large increase following the uh, uh, global financial crisis and during the uh, um, the uh, uh, early years after that crisis and during the Euro crisis. So uh, public debt was high, it rose even more. And in the um, um, emerging markets, which we measure on the left-hand vertical axis, um, you see a similar rise in public debts during the um, crisis as a result of the crisis, uh, but also that uh, in many parts of the emerging world, in fact, uh, pretty much everywhere with the exception of emerging and developing Europe, um, the uh, levels of public debt had been rising since uh, the, uh, the middle of the last decade, at least. And, uh, you know, there are different reasons for this in different countries, but um, uh, I think one, one notable reason is that over the first decade of this millennium, uh, uh, rapid growth in emerging and developing economies led to falls in debt to GDP ratios, uh, led to a growing middle class. And this, in turn, led to demands for government to do more. And um, with these, as in an environment of slower growth, uh, government debt levels rose. Um, and now they are at, at higher levels. The, the levels tend to be lower for um, emerging and developing economies. But I find it useful to, to move to the next graph and to show the percent increase in the debt to GDP ratio uh, uh, rather than levels. And here you can see that these percent increases in debt to GDP ratios were comparable to those in the advanced economies. Um, you know, that being said, there are a number of emerging markets uh, and frontier markets which is, have moved to very high debt levels. Uh, you know, the country of Ghana in Africa is approaching 
90 percent debt to gdp ratio so um this is rather worrisome um okay let me um talk a little bit about the global financial cycle um, and what that is uh, uh, and say a few words of background for those of you who may not have followed this emerging and important literature. Um, a number of writers, for example, Ellen Ray at London Business School and Yun Shin at the BIS have pointed to um, uh, global cycles in bank lending, leverage, asset prices, commodity prices uh, that um, tend to um, drive capital flows and um, especially capital flows to emerging markets as well as um, asset price inflation. And um, uh, Ellen Ray, together with a co-author, uh, Sylvia Miranda Agrippino at the Bank of England, have developed a, uh, an index of um, the global financial cycle, which I call GFC lowercase y here, which, uh, you know, in technical terms, uh, uh, uses a latent factor model to um, show that uh, uh, a single uh, global uh, uh, unobservable but measurable factor um, drives asset and commodity prices uh, to such a degree that it explains more than 20% of their variance. And basically to construct this, they use asset prices from uh, a large range of securities and commodities from uh, from all over the world. So in this graph, the um, blue line is real GDP growth in emerging and developing economies as measured by the IMF. The uh, brown um, 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 line is the um, uh, global financial cycle indicator, which is derived without reference to output at all, by the way. It's just based on asset and commodity prices. And I would I would argue that the the coherence between these two is fairly is fairly remarkable. That um, emerging economy growth is very, very closely linked to the global financial cycle. Um, uh, there's been a lot of further work on this. Um, as I said, the Miranda, Agrippino, and Ray paper, which was written uh, much earlier, but published in 2020 in the Review of Economic Studies is uh, one very basic paper, but there's an ECB working paper by uh, Beatrice Schäuble and co-authors that uh, also constructs quantity-based measures, uh, 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 which are very correlated with the uh, uh, Agrippino uh, and Ray measure, um, and that positively affects uh, uh, capital flow episodes. Um, uh, a paper by Davis et al. in the Journal of International Economics um, computes a global factor for not only asset prices, but for capital flows, and looks at the role of energy prices. And uh, uh, they find that there are two factors behind capital flows. Um, one of these is very much correlated with the uh, Miranda, Agrippino, and Ray measure. Uh, uh, one is very correlated with um, energy. And these uh, count for uh, large fractions of the variance of uh, not, not only emerging market capital flows, but advanced economy capital flows 
of the type I showed you for the US uh, initially. Now, um, Jin Shin has emphasized, and I think this is important for thinking about uh, how US monetary policy affects the world economy, that the nominal exchange rate of the dollar as an indicator of the global financial conditions. Uh, the idea being that when the dollar is very strong, global financial markets are in retraction. And when the dollar is very weak, they are in expansion. Um, here I show the uh, Agrippino Ray measure, uh, uh, again in, in brown, together with the US dollar's nominal effective exchange rate. And what you can see is that there's a striking negative correlation. You know, in some sense, you could argue that the, uh, the dollar is the bellwether of global financial conditions. Um, moreover, uh, the, dollar, uh, the dollar's nominal exchange rate is strongly negatively correlated with the growth of world trade as this chart shows. So here I basically graph the IMF's data on the growth of the volume of trade against the um, appreciation of the dollar. There's a strong negative correlation. And this probably reflects a number of factors. Uh, one is dollar invoicing in world trade. One is the availability of trade credit. Uh, one is the effect of um, uh, U.S. financial conditions on global investment, because world trade is particularly sensitive to to investment. And one is uh, a factor I'm going to show you next, which is the fact that when the dollar is strong, uh, global commodity prices uh, tend to plunge. And um, uh, here we can see the relationship between the dollar and commodity prices. And I just note that um, uh, the right axis is the uh, 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 dollar axis. The left axis is the commodity axis. And the commodity axis covers so much more ground than the dollar axis, which indicates how much more volatile are commodity prices even than the dollar, yet the negative correlation is very, very striking. So um, where does this leave us thinking about the, uh, the future? Um, the Fed is now strongly telegraphing uh, that it will raise interest rates in March. And um, uh, it's likely that as global interest rates rise, uh, public finances and emerging markets will be stressed, possibly leading to crises. And dollar appreciation is going to be a potent channel through the mechanisms I've shown by increasing the real value of dollar debts that, uh, that many uh, corporates and some governments have. Uh, currently, US policy is still accommodated. So I would say we're still in an expansive stage. But um, uh, in fact, capital flows to emerging markets have already begun to retract. And uh, uh, this is going to be a particular problem if uh, the Fed and other central banks fall behind the curve on inflation and tighten abruptly. Um, a Jackson Hole uh, symposium paper from two years ago by Shebnem Kalemlios Khan documents how US tightening raises risk premia in emerging markets. And uh, the supply chain driven inflation factors that all countries face will be an additional challenge. And uh, one very important area where these um, pressures are having an effect is on uh, global food prices. Um, there's currently a spike in global food prices, 
that is only comparable to the uh, spike in 2011 and the spike in 2007, 2008, both of which led to um, uh, episodes of social unrest in various places around the world. Uh, for emerging markets, failing to tighten monetary policy in the face of what the Fed is doing could erode the hard-won credibility I mentioned. Uh, and in fact, the number of central banks are already uh, in emerging market countries are already tightening. Um, going forward, I think we need to enhance the resilience of the financial system. Um, uh, Non-bank financial institutions have become increasingly big drivers of capital flows, yet are likely uh, or not at all regulated. Um, the market for U.S. Treasuries was a stress point in March of 2020. Uh, at some level, this is uh, uh, the market where the world's safe asset is traded. And so this is a question of global concern, and there are proposals for reform. Um, the global financial safety net with the IMF at its center uh, needs to be enhanced. And, uh, you know, frankly, the IMF has, has tried to uh, create, uh, including during this crisis, um, pre-qualification uh, facilities, instruments, where countries can, can quickly um, get resources without conditionality if they pre-qualify based on strong policies. These have not proved popular. Um, we certainly need to think about capital flow measures uh, as a regular part of the toolkit. The IMF has moved more in this direction. Uh, and the, the prospect that liquidity problems will morph into solvency problems uh, means that the Infrastructure for restructuring sovereign debt needs to be needs to be rethought, and we have to recognize that uh, in any such solution, um, China is critical because um, it is now providing so much uh, lending to so many uh, countries, particularly lower lower income countries. I would argue that exchange rate flexibility remains essential. Uh, used together with other reforms to the policy framework. And um, I think about um, a, a, a statement that was, was once made by a, a, a famous golfer. When I think about where we are, uh, he said that um, golf is a game of luck. And the more I practice, the luckier I get. Um, similarly, I think macro policy success in the last crisis has required luck. But the more we prepare, the luckier we will be in the future. So uh, I think there's a there's a big reform agenda uh, that the um, uh, you know frankly will will require a higher level of international cooperation than we have uh, seen recently. Okay, and with that, I'm going to uh, um, stop and take questions. I'm going to say uh, How are we going to uh, convey the questions? Uh, I saw one in the chat, but uh, I'm not sure what the best format is. Normally, normally, Dr. Virmani makes the first observations and has the privilege of asking a few questions before he opens the session to question answers. Okay. That's normally how we go about. Great. So let me just say that I think what uh, quite uh, in our view we've handled the uh, COVID very well. In fact, uh, I would wager better than 
many other color i won't go into that we found useful which were all used some and proved quite good Blind. Of course, India for the at OSS asset etc. But it's very very useful to have it organized the way you had and and Given the, I guess, Dr. Fermani, I, I could not hear you well, and I so I don't oh, know sorry. if there was actually a question question in no, there. No, I'm just opening it up to <laughs> question. Oh, <sorry>. Jared? <laughs> okay. Jared, do you yeah. want to ask a question? Yes, I did have a question before the session, and I think thanks for giving me this opportunity. There are a number of questions lined up. I know uh, Professor, Ash uh, Professor Ashima Goyal, our advisor of the think tank, Mr. Suman Berry, they're all lined up. But mm -hmm. I'll put my question and Professor, if you want to take a couple of questions together, I leave it to your discretion. My question was, the Fed Reserve already made an announcement that they are going to be, and we all expect in the March, in March, they will raise the interest rates. But then I wasn't very sure Given the inflation trend, how much would you, you are such an expert and you've been at uh, IMF, what would be your judgment that they will be raising the interest rate by how much and to what level? I ask that because that has implications for emerging countries like us. One quick question. I was very, uh, I've been reading about the invoicing of uh, international trade in US dollars. At one point when I was doing review of literature actively, it was almost 85% of world trade was invoiced in US dollars. Uh, any any idea, latest, what would be that figure like? Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, on the on the invoicing, uh, you know, the data the data are um, uh, uh, not that easy to come by. Um, Eighty percent sounds a little high to me, but but um, it's clear that the U.S. is the dominant currency in trade, followed by the euro, and there is a there is an awful lot of invoicing in dollars. So, um, uh, 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 and that's one of the factors I mentioned in terms of the dollar's effect on potentially on the volume on the volume of trade. You know, and the Fed. Um, I think it's a given that they will do a 25 basis point hike in March, especially after this morning's jobs report, which uh, had um, 467,000 jobs created uh, uh, in, uh, in January, despite the uh, Omicron variant. I mean, the, the, the week, you know, there's one week in January when these, these um, uh, surveys are taken, and this was the peak Omicron week. So, this is an incredible number. Uh, it's way above market expectations, and moreover, the December job numbers were revised upward. So, the U.S. has very, very strong job creation, very, very strong growth. Um, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I can't read Jay Powell's mind. Uh, but uh, I think he he will avoid a 50 basis point hike at this stage because I think that would that would um, uh, to some degree panic the markets. You know when you when you do a double hike, uh, uh, the markets really do get uh, into an emergency frame of mind, and um, I think he's still betting that uh, slow and steady can uh, can um, uh, bring about a soft landing 
And there, there was a question in the chat about what Janet Yellen did in 20 in 2015, 2016. That's a long story, but yes, she she did that fairly successfully. Um, I think a lot will depend on uh, the inflation numbers, and on February 10th, so in six days, there will be the the next release of the CPI. And if those have risen even higher than where they were last month, then I think the, the prospect of a 50 basis point hike will seriously come into view. But I think the, the um, you know, I, I, think, I think what he's gonna do is, is hike by 25 basis points at every meeting until there's evidence of inflation falling. And if that takes seven hikes this year, you know, I think he's going to follow a sequential procedure based on the incoming data and try to avoid um, an abrupt uh, hike. But then, you know, this, this, this idea of a 50 basis point hike, one of, the, one of the problems it would cause would be, I think, for global capital flows because uh, of the signal it would send. So, you know, we're all sort of hoping we don't see that. Um, I don't know that it's necessary, but um, you know the the jobs report today makes it a little more likely, uh, and uh, uh, I think the inflation data next week will, will be fairly decisive. Thank you. Thank. You. Yeah, uh, may I go ahead now? Um, uh, Hi, Suman. Uh, How are you? Uh, very well, Maury. Good to see you. And look, uh, first of all, thank you for a presentation that was so focused on emerging markets. That's unusual and extremely valuable. Um, I was, so two points really about resilience and agency. You were in effect saying that the emerging markets had agency in terms of counter-cyclical uh, policies at the early stages of the um, uh, of this crisis. Uh, that was interesting, and the references you provided were interesting. But I do want to go back to what uh, an observation of your Berkeley colleague, Barry Eichengreen. You know, he he wrote in 2006 about um, you know the comparison between uh, Europe at the periphery and the dollar at the center in the 1960s and the emerging markets, say China at the periphery now and the G7 at the center, still the dollar in many ways. And the demand for uh, monetary reform, you know, diluting the exorbitant privilege of the dollar, of the Fed, etc. So my question to you, my, I have two questions to you from an emerging points of view. Is the system broke that it needs fixing? And I'm talking really about the global financial cycle where the um, emerging markets, to some extent, are objects, not subjects. Or slow and steadily emerging markets are gaining agency and the issue is just keep going and not aim for anything dramatic like a Britain, Britain Woods do. Is there, from an emerging park market's point of view, a need for global monetary f reform, and what might it look like? Well, it's a it's a it's a good question. Um, you know, in terms of systemic reform. Um, you know, when the, when the Bretton Woods system was set up. The dollar was at its center by design. And interestingly, um, uh, uh, it appears, you know, if you, if you, uh, I haven't done a deep historical study, but according to uh, the history I've read, um, the, the sort of central um, uh, provisions of the Articles of Agreement relating to the dollar were actually inserted by Harry Dexter White. Uh, without consulting Keynes, who was was very much against this type of, of system and, uh, of course, wanted to have a world currency bank core. Um, but I would argue that even 
if that had not been the case, de facto, the dollar would have uh, would have been central, just given the circumstances in the post-war in the post-war period. Um, we we went through a period in the in around uh, the late 1970s when when I think the dollar centrality seriously came into question due to monetary instability in the U.S. But um, today the dollar is pretty much unchallenged, and this has been partly uh, a result of the success of inflation targeting and of, uh, of a long period of. Uh, Price stability in the U.S., but it's also the the result of um, you know network externalities that are very powerful in international financial markets. And you know Paul Krugman wrote about this kind of effect back in the early 1980s. Um, so unlike you know perhaps in early Bretton Woods, the the, the dollar's strength is is kind of organic and it reflects. You know the economic asymmetries of uh, um, financial market development and economic power in the in the world, and um, you know at some level, if you don't change those things, you're not going to change the um, the dollar's dominance. Now, China is trying uh, in a purposeful way to change that. I don't think that's going to be possible as long as China's Markets remain closed, and uh, I think that 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 you know all that President Xi has done to um, um, undermine uh, private initiative uh, in in China, and to um, bring back the uh, the heavy hand of the government in the in the economy is. Uh, Undermining any hope of the RMB becoming the global, the global, uh, uh, a global currency that can challenge the dollar, um, uh, that could change if the the U.S. actually weaponizes the dollar um, in its uh, in its dealings with uh, with Russia or other countries. But for now, uh, I don't want to speak for Barry, but. Um, uh, you know, I think the dollar the dollar system is going to be uh, hard to hard to break. So then the question is, what what um, you know what can emerging markets do? And I think that um, one answer is the um, uh, 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 to um, be more more able and willing to. Um, Insulate from the global capital market not only through a flexible exchange rate, but in some cases through um, explicit explicit controls. And so the IMF has developed an integrated policy framework, which is very highly theoretical. Uh, and uh, you know, a lot of the devil is in the details of how you do the how you do these things and what distortions you create. But in principle. Um, I think emerging markets should be thinking about, um, you know, perhaps transparent toolkits through which there can be some uh, decoupling from uh, the effects of the global cycle, uh, especially in so far as it's driven by by U.S. policy. And so that uh, requires country level reform, but also some some attention to the, uh, the the effects of capital controls on other countries. There is a cooperation issue there that that needs to be addressed. And uh, you know, here I think the fund can play a role in um, thinking about that. The fund is instinctively deep in its DNA, always been against any sort of financial cross border controls, even though those are explicitly allowed by the. Uh, Articles of agreement, and I think it's time to sort of get past that attitude and uh, realize that that capital flows, um, particularly when there are distortions in financial markets, can do damage. And um, uh, intervention in those is a legitimate um, policy tool. Thanks so much. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Ashima, would you like to ask? Uh, well, 
Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. Yes, uh, Dr. Oxford, this is a wonderful, wonderful talk. You know, you started by saying that um, emerging markets have uh, used macroprudential policy quite successfully, but now you are say you seem to be saying that if the US tightens, no matter what the emerging market cycle, they should follow, they have to follow, otherwise they will lose credibility. Now, in, in case they have sufficient reserves and other means of some, other means of intervening, shouldn't they use that in order to uh, give priority to their own domestic cycle if their inflation is low, et cetera? If it, certainly, if inflation is low, uh, which in, in, in most places, uh, well, in many emerging markets at the moment, it's, it's lower than in the United States, um, then that's fine. You know, but 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 I think the you know the the central bank in emerging markets has to be aware of um, uh, uh, you know will will inevitably be be aware of uh, what what is happening with capital flows and uh, and uh, 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 the effect on the exchange rate and through that the impact on domestic inflation. And they may not necessarily will, but they may have to respond to that uh, because it simply worsens the trade-off that they face, right? At, you know, at each point you're you're trading off inflation credibility against other domestic goals, and so um, you know, on balance, a sharp Fed tightening is going to push um, central banks in the direction of tightening themselves uh, at the short end. Uh, at the policy rate and uh, at the long term, and the uh, the data show a strong coherence between uh, long term rates in the U.S. and long term rates in emerging markets, and so uh, that may be an area where uh, the central bank has has very little has very little control, actually, and that I think is is a is a uh, an area of, uh, of concern because that evolution of long term rates uh, and the effect to which it which it has on investment may be may be quite unwelcome. Mm -hmm. But there again, it may be that um, some form of capital. Uh, control, I mean, what the the. Uh, the uh, ASEAN countries like to refer to um, these as uh, capital account safeguard measures. Which I think is a great euphemism, but I think those do need to be thought about uh, this context. You know, I had asked that question. Thank you. I had asked that question about Janet Yellen. Now, the one thing about her communication was she made it uh, made the moves dependent on data, but at the same time, she also said that adjustment would be gradual. So mm -hmm. now, in this case, uh, Powell has moved towards data-based guidance. The U.S. Fed has moved towards that. But that gradual has been left out, which is dangerous, you know, because if there is a very sharp adjustment and there are a lot of people who think that the supply chain, et cetera, demand might unwind and you might have prices come down. So is this gradual important in, in communication? You know, Yellen and um, Powell, um, you know, the two, the two environments in which they're operating are are very different uh you know Ye yellen was in an environment where um you know inflation pressures were very moderate um the dollar had actually strengthened a lot uh starting in 2014 to um you know in anticipation of the uh, the Fed's early tightening compared to other countries, and um, if if you recall, um, by uh, the summer or fall of uh, 2015, a number of emerging central bank governors were were basically begging her to tighten. I mean, Raghu Rajan you know, in speeches said, please do it already because you're creating more volatility 
as people wonder when you're going to tighten. So just tighten. And finally, in December of 2015, um, uh, she uh, she did so. Now she was she had been deterred by the the uh, uh, turbulence uh, that was set off by the Chinese devaluation in August of 2015, and then in January of 2016, shortly after her tightening, global markets melted down for a period of about six months, and she put the tightening on hold for an entire year. It was a year before the second rate uh, increase occurred. Uh, there actually was a global um, uh, meltdown in progress. And of course, in June of 2016, you had Brexit, which further disturbed markets. So there was a lot, there was a lot going on, but she could afford to promise to be gradual. There was no um, inflation of the type we're seeing now. I think I think Powell has has purposely left out the word gradual because he wants to signal to markets that the Fed's priority now is inflation and that inflation is too high. And if he were to insist on gradual, that would be counter to his um, his goal of signaling a hawkish stance in the hope that he doesn't have to abruptly tighten, that he can be gradual, right? So at some level, the, 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 uh, there's a hope to be gradual, but not a promise to be gradual. Mm -hmm. And um, um, you know, at the end of the day, as I said, uh, we'll see where we are a week from now when we see the next mm -hmm. US uh, CPI numbers. Uh, and we'll be able to assess whether whether uh, gradual will 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 be the um, the order of the day at the March FOMC. But um, mm -hmm. I'm sure he is hoping for an excuse to uh, to uh, just do that 25 basis point increase after today's jobs report. And I haven't I haven't looked at what the markets think about you know in terms of the forward. Um, rates, what they, how they're digesting this um, uh, um, yet. It's, you know, it's too, it's too early here. Thank you. In terms I of, thank you, in terms of the glo global, just one last quick question. Yeah. In terms of the global financial crisis, you know, you made the point that there is, and Suman's question, you made the point that there is very little regulation of non-bank financial sector in general and a lot of cross-border flows now come from that not from banks and most of basil focused on bank regulation so in terms of a new kind of financial order can we sort of in the long term move in that direction which might reduce this extreme volatility of cross-border flows financial stability board is actively considering um, what sort of measures could be recommended to the global community in that in that regard, and um, you know, in the in in the global financial crisis, as you say, um, you know, banks were the uh, sort of the name of the game. But now, in terms of lending to emerging markets, it's it's uh, shifted more toward non-bank actors, and so uh, clearly something has to be um, done in that in that regard. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been really wonderful talking to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I think we are well past our time, at least 12 minutes over. So thank you very much. And with that, let me conclude the talk and, and hand it over to Charan. Thank you so much, Professor. You see there are a number of questions in the chat box, but we have run out of time. Uh, we are really thankful to you for sparing time and speaking to us. Must mention to you in few days from today, you know, on February 9, we have our monetary policy announcement coming up and we are all very alert about what the American, uh, the Fed is announcing. So the, your talk today is so timely and contemporary for us. We want to thank you for giving us such a comprehensive review of the financial markets. Uh, I was very much impressed by your linkages uh, that you have related the dollars uh, with different uh, variables, something we really need to watch, especially the commodity prices. And I thought that's very, very important. Uh, so th this recording will be available by tomorrow noon. We'll be sending you the link. And of course, we intend to put it on uh, Twitter also. Uh, 
because of <laughs> such important talk that we have had today. So thanks again. I must mention that on February 11, we are having Professor Kingshuk Sarkar from Goa Institute of Management speaking to us on labor reforms in India, something which we have not discussed on our forum for a long time. So I would welcome all of you. And that will be the traditional time slot, 4 to 5.30. Uh, so with this, once again, let me thank our chairman, Dr. Vimani, to have chaired the session today, Professor Maury Hofsfield, to have delivered such a beautiful talk for all of us to understand what's happening in the global market. We especially requested him. He's away from Washington, far away. So he'll give us a clear picture and with his expertise, we all have read his book, I think, taught his book. And with his expertise, we thought that would be the best uh, professor to talk to us today on this important issue. The last time we had the jitters. This time, of course, it's been a little more gradual. So jitters, I'm, we are not expecting. But then everybody is worried in the, and brings in lots of uncertainty. So thank you, Professor, once again for this talk today. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you for inviting me.